So today we got something a little different. No face cam. I know, I know. Y'all wanna see my face, but look, I'm here with you spiritually. You feel me? I seen y'all really love that video about that extremely final boss racist reporter, Patrick Howley. I don't know who this black guy is who's hosting it. This is supposed to be country music. No offense. I mean, y'all have hip hop and basketball. Yeah, him. So I thought, well, all of this racism in the air, it'll be extremely fitting to do a video about this extremely old Southern dude that did grow up in a racist family, which of course caused him to become racist or have racist ways because that's all he was taught or that's all that he'd seen. But my boy had a life-changing experience, but my boy was able to see the non-racist light at the end of the tunnel. And today we're gonna be going ahead and listening to his story so all of y'all races out there, all of y'all Patrick Howleys can learn to see the light at the end of the tunnel and realize we all people, everybody within their race got bad people and good people. It's really not much deeper than that. I have a trouble, I have trouble telling. I have trouble telling this story. Now we gotta get deep. It's a deep video. <clears throat> Franklin McCalley was born in the segregated South as a white, privileged boy. McCalley grew up ignorant and deeply bigoted. As a 10 year old, I got on the bus for my school. Everybody was black, except for one seat. There were no seats and a black lady was sitting beside that seat. And this lady said, I'll never forget it. She said, honey, you can sit right here. And she patted the seat, said, honey, twice. Honey, it's okay, you can sit. Elaine, I sat in that seat like this. I didn't move a muscle for three miles. I got off first. I went home. I didn't tell my parents I'd sat by a black woman. Look at that. A simple act of kindness. Sharing a fucking seat. My boy is about 120 years old. He probably got one more breath left before he out of here. But he remembered that story when he was 10 years old that a, a black lady shared a seat with him. He remembered that for the rest of his life. This is why racism to me is such a kindergarten concept. When you really think about it, the only reason racism continues, despite all the horrific history about racism, the only reason that is still alive today is because people can't think for themselves. So what people do is, or they great grandma or they granddad or grandma or mom, dad, whatever. People are literally just passing down this information and these stereotypes about, let's say if I'm a white man, oh, these blacks go out here and rob and they kill and just steal and they run away from their babies and they just, the horrible, they just the scum of the earth. Telling that to my kid, right? And my kid grow up, been hearing that all his life, and now he is already in his mind that this is what's true. Because when you a kid, what? You gonna listen to your parents. You hold them the most high in your mind. They are the most respectable people to you in your life. As it should be. However, it's just a, a toxic road. We have horrible, idiotic parents that push bullshit. Just think about how simple life could be if everybody just looked at each other as human beings and say, oh, this man need a seat? Let me give him a seat. Instead of, oh, this white man need a seat? I'm not scooting over. This black man need a seat? I'm not scooting over. This black woman need this? I'm not doing that because she black. Or I'm gonna treat him this way because of the race. It's retarded. But anyway, <clears throat> McCallie hit a turning point in 1961. He begrudgingly attended a church meeting between his college and black students from another college. John was the black student's leader. Finally, I decided I'd say something. I said, John, let me ask you something. How come black troops in World War II fought so miserably? They surrendered, they didn't fight very hard. He said, Frank, would you hear that? I said, my father told me that. My boy asked a question because of what his father told him. He said, hey, why do black troops surrender, run away, be trash, basically. The other guy asks him, where'd you hear that? That exchange just shows somebody is thinking for themselves. Cause he could have easily just said, well, that's what they are. Or he could have called his father stupid or just, just could have just perpetuated the situation and say, yeah, black troops do do that because they're idiots. You know, them blackies, they're not good for nothing, but he didn't. 
He asked him, where did you hear that information? To get basis on where this question is coming from, which is so important. A lot of people nowadays just take information, run with it, spew the bullshit, and just, it's, it's like COVID. Nigga hear some bullshit and go tell somebody else, and now they saying the same bullshit that was wrong in the first place, and nobody's asking questions. Just hearing shit and spewing it out. Now, John could have said, your father's an idiot. If he'd said it, the conversation is over. I never would have gone anywhere. He didn't say that. He said, Franklin, I don't think you and I know enough about that to discuss it intelligently. Save my face, save my father's face. Told him, neither of us know enough about the situation to make an intelligent decision. And you see my boy even stated it himself. If he would have said, nigga, your father just stupid, that's why. He wouldn't have listened no more, and he would have remained a racist pretty much. So just that simple phrase of saying, well, I don't believe neither of us are well informed enough to come up with a logical conclusion, changed his whole man life. And say, wait a minute, why do I believe what I believe? Crazy. He said, but let me ask you something. You have anybody fighting World War II? I said, yeah, I had two uncles. One was in the Philippines, one was at Pearl Harbor when it was bombed. He said, is that right? He said, I did too. I had two uncles fight World War II. I said, great. He said, you know where we eat lunch? I said, you don't eat with me. He said, that's right. My uncles and I, who fought in World War II for freedom and justice and pursuit of happiness, we leave, we get on a bus and we ride two miles out of town to eat lunch because none of the stores we shop in will let us eat. God damn. Imagine having a shit and you gotta hop on the bus, ride two miles. You gotta hold that shit in for two miles to go to the bathroom. And you know it was a dirty ass bathroom. If you was black back then in the South, I can only imagine. They probably was handing out bricks to wipe your ass with or put some damn leaves on the road. And my stomach got tight and I didn't want to hear any more. He said, did you go to the bathroom? I said, yeah, I go to the bathroom. He said, where do you go? I said, I go anywhere I want. He said, my uncles and I, we get on a bus. We ride two miles out of town to go to the bathroom because we can't go anywhere. Shit. I listened for the rest, of the rest of the three hours. When I got to my dorm, I lay down and cried. I sobbed for three hours. Next day, I went in and talked to Dean of Men. I said, it's crazy. We're studying English and math and science. And right across the street over there, we got people, citizens we don't even know. It didn't make sense. And it's, it's so true. Probably, primarily my black dudes out there, my black men. I know you've been walking down the street one time, maybe a white man, white lady was coming down the opposite side or the same street but the opposite side of the street. And eventually y'all gonna cross paths to walk past each other. But then, you know, they cross the street. Now maybe they needed to cross the street. Maybe they did need to cross the street, but you know you was part of the reason of why they crossed the street. And the reason I think this is, is exactly what my boy just explained. It's literally just the fear of not knowing. If you're not around a lot of black people, the only thing you have to go off of is what you're being told by maybe racist family members, maybe what you see on TV, fucking Instagram, Twitter, all of the stereotypes, because you have no real information to go off in your actual everyday life if you're not around black people. So you just take what you hear. But this man was smart enough and understood how to think for himself enough to actually be willing to have that conversation even though he grew up with family members and his dad telling them this is how black people are. He didn't take that path and just become another racist and just spin the cycle. He actually had empathy to sit down and the willingness to sit down and understand the opposite side, to put himself in somebody else's shoes to understand where they're coming from. A lot of times, especially nowadays, people don't give a damn about everybody else's struggles because everybody think they're a fucking victim Everybody think their life is the worst life possible, which lead them to believe they don't give a damn about nobody else's struggle because their life is so bad. But anyway, 
Our boy that was initially scared at 10 years old to sit next to a black woman now works to bring white and blacks together. This is just a short little video. Like I said, I did just want to do this one because we did just have the extremely racist idiot Patrick Howley going crazy going on crazy racist rants because black people was at the country music award i thought it would be a nice little change of pace to go ahead and do a video about a southern older white man that realized the error in his ways and changed it for the better and didn't just continue the cycle if y'all did enjoy this video make sure you click that like and subscribe button to join the sec leave your thoughts down below we out Happy.